Alrighty. Let us continue in our study through the book of Revelation. I know it's been a, a few weeks since I've been here. Uh, of course, I was out elk hunting. And then uh, this past week, we had uh, Cameron Meeks from Lads to Leaders. And that was wonderful to hear him speak, especially on the, the work that we are definitely considering to do with, I say considering, the decision's been made. We're going to be doing last leaders with the kids. It's going to be fantastic work. It's great to hear him on that. But it's been a little while since we've been in the book of Revelation. Uh, go ahead and open up to chapter 9, Revelation chapter 9, and I'll meet y'all there in just a minute. So, Revelation, and I, I feel like I just need to recap this, Revelation is exactly what it sounds like. It is a revealing. That's what it is. Especially for the first 11 chapters. The first 11 chapters. We're, we're coming up on that here pretty quick. Chapter 11 and chapter 12 is a great hinge in the book of Revelation. We'll cover that when we get there. But everything from chapter 4 up to chapter 11 is one big, long, rolling Revelation, one big long rolling vision that was given uh, to John uh, by Jesus Christ and assisted by se several different angels. Now, in that, let me just review really quickly. Revelation chapter 4, the first thing John sees is the throne room. He gets that, that famous throne room scene into God or of God into heaven. And then in Revelation chapter 5, after having detailed what he had seen, he turns back to look at God on the throne. And he, and he looks there and he sees a book in the right hand of God. And no one was found worthy to come up and take the book and to open it. Uh, until Jesus steps up, the lamb the, from, the, from the tribe of, of Judah, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the lamb that had been slain, steps up, takes the book out of the right hand of God. Well, then once he takes the book, he starts breaking the seals, opening the book. First uh, four seals are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Seal number five and seal number six is who it is that the destruction is coming for and why. And then there's an interlude there. And in chapter seven, what you see is a question that was posed. Who can stand? This mass destruction is coming. And John asked the question, who's able to stand? Well, chapter seven is an answer to that. That's, that's where we see the redeemed. We see the picture of the 144,000. Then the seventh seal is broken in the book. And once that seventh seal was broken, silence broke, silence broke out in heaven. And then what we had was the beginning of seven trumpets. So seven seals with the seventh seal bringing us to seven trumpets. Okay. Now with seven trumpets, we are four trumpets in as those angels had blown in chapter 8. And I'll give you just a quick detail in chapter 8 because the scene and the message has really not changed. Rome's going to fall. God is avenging the martyred saints. And that's really it. And in chapter 8, we see the trumpet sounding. Uh, trumpet number 1, 2, 3, and 4 all point to Rome with the falling of the star being uh, the, uh, uh, the leader of Rome itself is going to be overthrown. Uh, verse 7, hail and fire mixed with blood. That's, that's God's uh, vengeance that we saw on Egypt. Well, now it's going to be here at, on Babylon. And we saw that in, in the fourth angel sounding his trumpet um, with the uh, sun and the moon and the stars being darkened, further signifying the destruction that was going to be coming towards Rome. Now, in chapter 9, we're going to be getting to trumpets number 5. And trumpet number six. And then chapter 10, we're going to have another, chapter 10 and 11, another small interlude. Now, trumpet number five, we're going to see in just a second. But let's go ahead and get into Revelation chapter nine and verse one. And we'll just start all the way on this end of the room. Mr. Farrell Whitley, when you're there nice and loud, will you read Revelation chapter nine and verse one for us? Now, I'll, I'll say this before we get into this, by the way. Let me, just, let me just detail this real quick. This is one of the most difficult chapters in all of Revelation for me to interpret. 
I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. This one's going to be a tough one, okay? Now, I can tell you what we know for sure. But there's going to be a lot of things in this chapter that I cannot sit here and tell you this equals that, okay? I just can't do it. I, I just can't do that, okay? But I can tell you what we know that it means, okay? I just kind of wanted to throw that out there, okay, before we get into it. Mr. Farrell Whitley, will you read verse 1 for me, please, sir? Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven, which had fallen to the earth, and the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. Okay. Let's dive into that for just a little bit. It says a star which had fallen from heaven, uh, which from heaven had fallen to the earth. Okay? That star, we later realize, is an angel from heaven. Now, that's not to be confused with the third trumpet. Now, when the third trumpet blew, he was talking about the leader of Rome, which, was, uh, which John was quoting from Isaiah to describe the leader of Babylon as a fallen star. Isaiah chapter 14. And what we see here is a star fallen from heaven, which had fallen to the earth. Very similar language. But later on in the passage, look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. It says, They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. Okay? So... In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1, the star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. And you see right there in verse 1, it says that uh, had fallen to the earth. The keys of the bottomless pit was given to him, which later we learn is, is the abyss. We'll get to more of that here in just a little bit. That star is an angel from heaven. Because it says, they have as king over them the angel of the abyss. Now, the reason why... We know that it is not an adversary who has this authority over the abyss. It's because here in just a little bit we're going to learn that this swarm that is coming up out of the abyss went out to destroy those who did not have the, the seal of God. Well, who doesn't have the seal of God? Well, that would be the unright. The seal of God is the righteous. That's exactly right. So those who don't have the seal of God, that's the unrighteous. That's who the angel over the abyss has control over, and that's who he was sent out to kill, was the, was the unrighteous. Rome, basically. I'll go ahead, spoiler alert, it's Rome, okay? We'll get into more of that here in just a little bit. But, just know this, that when it says, the star from heaven which had fallen to the earth, it is an angel, as referred to in verse 11. It's not an adversary, because this person is going out and killing people who do not have the seal of God. Which again, those are the people who are murdering Christians, okay? Keep that in the back of your mind if you ever think God's a big meaning. This is vengeance. Righteous vengeance, okay? Now, he says there also in verse 1 that the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. The key of the bottomless pit was given to him. Now, here's where I've got to be honest with you. I don't know exactly what that bottomless pit is, nor do I know who this angel is, nor do I know what the key is, okay? I just don't know those things. Nothing that he's quoting from here is found anywhere in the Old Testament. Therefore, if we were to make any sort of interpretation, do you know what we would be doing? We would be reading into Scripture something that's just not simply there, okay? So let's not focus on those things. Let's focus on what we know, okay? Now, what we know is that this pit, uh, otherwise referred to as the abyss, is connected with the home of demons, okay? Luke chapter 8, verse 30 and 31, Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss same Greek word, okay? And so, what we see is the same Greek word used in this famous story of Jesus crossing over the Sea of Galilee and coming to the man who had been demon-possessed by many demons. And he responded, we are legion, for we are many. They were begging him not to command him to go away into the abyss, okay? Same Greek word. Now, where, do you remember where Jesus sent the demons, by the way? Pop quiz. Do what? Pigs. Pigs into the herd of swine, and they went right off over the hill. The farmers were not very happy. So, 
This pit, whatever this bottomless pit is, it's connected with the home of demons. That's where he was going to send them away to. Also, it's, it refers to Hades as well. Okay? Let me show you this passage. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 7, in fact, let me flip over there because this gives us a little bit of context. If you want to flip over there with me, do that too. Let me mark this because I'm going to definitely be coming back to it. The verse right before verse 7, Romans chapter 10 and verse 6, uh, Paul here is, is quoting out of the Old Testament to speak of uh, Jesus, of something deep about the gospel system. And in verse 6 there he says, But the righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Do not say in your heart, Who will, into, uh, who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Verse 7, Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. All right? Well, let's think about that for just a second. Jesus was brought down. Where was he brought down from? Where did he come from originally? Heaven. From heaven, right? Well, then he lived here on the earth. Where did he ascend down into? And at what point did he do it? Hades. Hades at the point of death. That's exactly right. Hades is not hell, by the way. That's a, that's a common misconception in the church, by the way. Not just the church, but in just the religious world in general. There's a lot of people who think that Jesus went to hell when he died. That is just simply not true. Not found in anywhere in Scripture. And if you want to know more about that, come see me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about that afterwards. But he went to Hades. Hades in the Greek world, in the Greek language, literally means the not seen realm. That's what it means. The Greek word for hell is Gehenna. Okay? Two completely different Greek words. This is Hades. Well, Hades, the realm of the unseen, is referred to as the abyss, okay? And I got one more for you. Here it's used as a tool of God's wrath. It's used as a tool of God's wrath. Go back to verse 11 right here, and I got it on the screen for you. This is where we identify who the star is, the fallen star is. We identify him as the angel of the abyss, and then we have his name. His name tells us a little bit about him. His name is, in Hebrew, is Abaddon. And in the Greek, he has the name Apollyon. Abaddon and Apollyon. They both mean the same thing, and they both mean destroyer. Okay? So the angel of the abyss, who has the keys of the abyss. By the way, keys signify authority. That's more than likely what that signifies. So he has the authority over the abyss... He is described as a destroyer. That's his name. And so what we see here is this re reference to the bottomless pit, the abyss. It's a symbol of destruction is what it is. A tool of God's wrath. Let's get into that a little bit more. Maybe this will help explain it just a little bit. Is there a Greek word no. for key? Do I now? Is there a Greek word for key? For key? Yeah, key. Yes. Is there a Greek word for that? Mm -hmm. Yes. What does it mean? Well, I've never looked up that Greek word, but I tell you what, we'll look it up afterwards. I don't think there is a reference to a, a key specifically that in the Old Testament that we would be able to put this up next to and say, oh, well, this means that. Because okay? he's not quoting from the Old Testament anywhere. So. And again, this is where we've got to be very careful in the book of Revelation. Is if, if John's not quoting from something specifically referenced in the Old Testament, or if the interpretation is not given for us, we can't read into it, okay? We just can't put a, a, a meaning behind something that we're not given in Scripture. With that being said, we will have, at the end of this chapter, we will have a general overview, uh, uh, overarching meaning of what this chapter is trying to say, okay? Let's continue on, and let's look at verse 2. Uh, Pharaoh read for us, uh, Charles Keith, uh, in the back, will you read uh, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 2 for me, please? All right, let's look at that for just a second. It says, he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up 
out of the pit. So the pit's open, the abyss is open, and he just sees this great smoke cloud coming up out of it. Now, this, the Greek word for went up out, does anybody have anything else other than went up? Anybody? Went up right here. He opened the bottom of the pit and smoke and went up. Do what? Rose. Okay. Okay. Went up in the Greek language literally means walked up. Walked up from. Okay? Or crawled up from. All right? Keep that in the back of your mind, and we're going to move on, okay? Just make a little pin note of that. It says, so he opens the pit, and it says, the sun and the air were darkened. Now, any time in the Bible, and I mean any time, what, what, what happens when something becomes dark? Bad things, right? That, 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 that's God's way of judgment upon something, anything. Exodus chapter 10, verse 21, the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand towards the sky. There may be darkness over the land of Egypt even the darkness which may be felt. Okay? So the pit's opened up. A great smoke cloud comes up over it, so great that it darkens the, the sky and the air. Now look at verse 3. Charles, since you're still there, will you read verse 3 for me? Then out of the smoke, smoke came on earth. Then the human power and the earth had power. Okay. So, locusts came upon the earth. All right? Well, go back to this right here. He opened the bottomless pit. The smoke went up out of the pit. The Greek word for went up is literally walked up or crawled up. Well, now what do we see coming up out of the pit? Out of the smoke. Locust. That's exactly right. Pop quiz real quick. What other book of the Bible is all about locusts? Exodus. Huh? Exodus. Well, Exodus has got a little bit, but I mean all about locusts. But yes, Exodus, absolutely, which plays into exactly what God uses it for. The book of Joel. The book of Joel. That's, that's a tough one, by the way. That's, a, that's like an upper level, upper level quiz. Uh, the book of Joel is all about locusts. And when you think about Joel and the book of Joel and, and, and how God is sending, and, and by the way, the book of Joel was literally talking about locusts, okay? And the reason why God was sending this great locust plague like the world had never seen before is because the children of Israel turned their back on him. And that was God's way of wanting to punish the children of Israel. And so he sent locusts to them. Same thing in Exodus, like Casey just said, is locusts were used in Exodus to punish the nation of Israel. Well... Now we have this picture of locusts coming out. And in verse 3 it says, The locusts came forth upon the earth. Power was given to them as the scorpions of the earth have power. When you think about scorpions, those aren't very nice bugs, are they? The locusts aren't very nice bugs. And so what you see here is this, this mass of, of locusts coming up out of this abyss, coming up out of this pit, and ascending upon the earth so great that it even darkened the sky is that, a, is that a picture of something good's about to happen or something really bad's about to happen? Something really bad, okay? We don't need to know what the key is or who that angel is to understand that something bad's about to take place, okay? Let's move on. Let's look at verse 4. Let's look at verse 4. And uh, Mr. Grady Gibson, will you read verse 4 for us nice, nice and loud for everybody? They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Alright, so the nature of a locust is to eat grass, green things, and trees, right? That's the nature of a locust. Well, what John is seeing here is not actually literally locusts. you got to remember this is figurative language. He's, that he's pointing towards something. But to harm what? Well, it says there, only the men who do not have the seal of God. Throughout the book of Revelation, what you're going to see here is a contrast between the seal of God and the seal of the beast. You see this great contrast back and forth all the time is those that have uh, the number of the beast or the seal of the beast and those that have the number or the seal of God. 
Well, in other passages, when it references the seal of God, what it's talking about is people who are worshipers of God. Well, when he talks about the seal of the beast, we're going to learn this, but I'll go ahead and tell you who it is. The beast is Emperor Domitian. That's who it is. We'll identify him later on. It's not Satan, okay? Everybody thinks the number of the beast is, is Satan. It's not talking about Satan. It's talking about Emperor Domitian. And the number of the beast is, is opposite of the number given to the worshipers of God. And the seal that's on their forehead is a worshiper of God. Well, the seal of those who are of the beast is worshipers of the emperor. That's what you got to keep in context of all of this. Why are Romans slaughtering Christians wholesale? Is it because they just don't like them? Is it because they're different from them somehow? They've got a different culture? Why is Rome slaughtering Christians? Because Christian says, I refuse to worship your emperor. That's why. That's why they're dying. That's why they're being drugged out in the gladiator rings. Not because they're different. It's not because they worship Christ. It's because they say, I refuse to worship your emperor. And so what you see in the book of Revelation is this great contrast between those who are sealed with God and those who are sealed with the beast. Well, the beast is the emperor of Rome. And that's what you see here. Only the men who do not have the seal of God, meaning those who worship uh, those who worship the emperor, the beast. Now, let's continue on. Oh, there you go. I knew I put a verse up there. I didn't put a verse in my notes, but I put it on the PowerPoint. God's redeemed have a mark on their forehead. Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. We're not there yet. But it says, And with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father, written on their forehead. Well, again, if you go, you back, back up just a few verses, and it says that the worshipers of the emperor have the number of the beast on their foreheads. You see the contrast? You see it all throughout the book of Revelation, and you see it right here in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 4. Now, it also says there in verse, uh, in verse 4 that they're being held back a little bit, Right? There's this regulation of, of destruction that's taking place. Well, we're going to see that again here in verse 5. Uh, Grady Gibson, why don't you go ahead and read verse 5 for us again, please, sir. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. Okay. So it says they were not permitted to kill anyone. And again, showing their limited power okay and it says but to torment for five months this is interesting because five months is the normal lifespan of a locust that's the normal lifespan and again we're not we're not talking about actual literal locusts here again we're talking about something that is symbolic of locusts destruction that is symbolic of locusts but the five months is definitely a reference to um, the, the normal lifespan of a locust. But again, no, notice, and see this is where people take, and they'll, they'll pull this chapter out of context, and they'll point to the end of the world. And they'll talk about the end of the world as it relates to everything that we're talking about right here. Notice the, the, the limited destruction and the limited amount of time here. When we talk about the end of the world, we talk about Jesus coming in the clouds with a trumpet, with a, in the twinkling of an eye, in a moment. All of the earth is going to be, is going to be uh, burned up in fire. It's just going to be gone. It's not going to be this delayed, delayed out process. Jesus comes in the cloud. The world is going to be burned up. The dead in Christ shall rise first. We who are alive will be caught up with him in the clouds. But what you see here is limited destruction in a specific <coughs> amount of time, a, 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 a longer length of time than just the moment of the twinkling of an eye. You're talking about five months. And again, showing just a, 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 a normal length of time, or, a, or a, a, a longer length of time, but not ages, okay? As, as if a thousand years. And again, the number 1,000 in the book of Revelation is used to speak of uh, long periods of time, whereas 
one hour, one day, five months, is to speak of shorter amount of times, okay? Now, it also says there that their torment was like the torment of scorpions. Scorpions is used symbolically throughout the Old Testament to speak of divine discipline. 1 Kings 12, 11 is a good example. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips. I will discipline you with scorpions. And so you see scorpions used symbolically for divine discipline throughout the Old Testament. Well, that's what's spoken of here in Revelation chapter 9. Now, let's move on and let's look at verses 7 through 10. Revelation chapter 9, verses 7 through 10. Uh, Gene Stewart, will you read that nice and loud for everyone? Uh, the locusts looked like horses prepared for battle. On their head, they wore something like crowns of gold, and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Oh, one more verse. Verse 10. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had power to torment people for five months. All right. Let's get into that just a little bit. What you, what you read there just then, that, it was a depiction of, of, of a lot of military-type words, wasn't it? You've got uh, chariots and horses and, and battle and uh, teeth of lions. And so what you see there is this, this depiction of these locusts are dressed like warriors and are, are going out into battle. Now, I want you to compare that to Joel. And again, the book of Joel, the minor prophet book, is all about locusts. The whole book is, and they're talking about literally locusts. But John here is quoting from the book of Joel, okay? Notice this with me. It says in John, or in, I'm sorry, in John, in Revelation 9, 7 through 10, it says that these locusts, they had appearances uh, like horses prepared for battle. So look at Joel, chapter 2, verse 4. Their appearance is like the appearance of a horse, and like a war horse. So they run, okay? Very, very similar. It said also that they had teeth of lions. In verses 7 through 10. Well, in Joel one through, uh, chapter 1, verse 6, it says, For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion. And again, Joel's talking about actual locusts. One more. In Revelation, uh, chapter 9, verses 7 through 10, it says that of these locusts, their sound of their wings like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. And Joel chapter 2, verse 5, it says, with a noise as of chariot, they leap on the tops of the mountains. Again, speaking about locusts. And so what you see there is this comparison between locusts in the book of Joel to describe destruction of Israel. And John is using locusts to describe of the destruction of Rome. Do you see it? And by the way, it says there in verse 10, it says they have tails like scorpions. And stings, and in their tail is their power to hurt men for five months. Now I want you to remember something right here, and I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there, and I'll explain it later. Parthian war horses would have sharp instruments on the back side of their horses, as well as on the front side, and so that whenever a Parthian war horse would engage in battle. It would not only charge into people, hurting people, but once a Parthian would charge upon somebody and hurt them going this direction, they could take their horse and go backwards and hurt somebody going in the other direction as well. Okay? Lock that away in the back of your mind, and I'll get to that in literally two seconds, okay? Parthian war horses. And so when it says right here in verse 10 that uh, they have tails like scorpions, and in their tails is the power to hurt men. Just remember that, okay? And then in verse 11 and 12, it says, They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek his name is Apollyon, both of them meaning destruction. And we covered that already. Verse 12, The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these. Then, that is trumpet number five, okay? 
So let me just wrap up trumpet number five real quick, okay? Destruction is coming to Rome. That's pretty much it. That's it in a nutshell. Something bad is about to happen. The angel comes up and he unlocks the abyss and this, this great smoke cloud comes bellowing out and it turns out to be locusts. And the locusts come out and they destroy men who are not sealed of God. They're destroying the unrighteous is what they're doing. And they're described as, as being in battle and war horses and the strength of their power is in their tail. Now we get into trumpet number six. Trumpet number six, and what we have here is the result of God's judgment. And let's read together verses 13 and 16. Revelation chapter 9. Let's look at 13 and 16. Uh, Casey, why don't you read verses 13 through 16 for us, please? <clears throat> And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was two hundred million. I heard, them number, I heard the number of them. All right. First things first, let's get into that real quick. It says... The golden altar, which is before God. All right. Pop quiz. We'll see how well y'all have been listening to me or how well I've been preaching. Okay. The golden altar. Who is under the golden altar that is before God? That's been referenced multiple times. The souls of the martyrs. The martyred saints. Yes. I knew. I just knew it. I knew that, that y'all were listening to me. All right. The martyred saints. That's the whole reason this has taken place, isn't it? The whole reason why destruction is coming upon Rome is because there are martyred Christians under the altar, which is before God. Revelation chapter 5, and with the fifth seal is where, oh, sorry, Revelation chapter 6, with the fifth seal that is open. That's what we see. And so now we see it again. And by the way, this isn't the last time you're going to see it. You're going to see it many more other times. Uh, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God. And so now we see it again. We see trumpet number six blown, and it says, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Does anybody know what a, what a horn of the altar is? On the four corners, they had horns that came up out of the altar. Yes. Um, they discover them still to this day. By the way, this right here... In, in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 13 is how archaeologists know. Archaeologists discover altars all the time. All the time. And they can tell whether it's a pagan altar or a Jewish altar. And how do they know? The it has horns on it. That's exactly right. So go home and Google it. They found lots of altars. In fact, they found one at the, at the base of a mountain uh, that more than likely is Mount Sinai. I encourage you to go look that up too. Fascinating. Anyway, so he hears this voice from the golden altar, which we know is where the, the martyred souls are underneath, and from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And it says there, in verse 14, it says, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. All right. Did anybody pay attention to the news when they were making a big deal about the Euphrates River going dry over there? In, uh, in the Middle East. Anybody ever hear that? I had people calling me, asking me, is the apocalypse coming because the great river Euphrates dried up? I had people asking me all kinds of stuff. It's like, well, what's going to come up out of it? I hear people, all these TikTok videos of like, you know, Euphrates River is dried up. And, and what's, what's about to happen? Isn't this a sign of the end of the age? It's not the first time. You know what they're talking about? We're talking about this verse, okay? This is what they're talking about. Release the, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. Also, there's another reference to the Euphrates River later on in the book of Revelation and the drying up of it. And we'll get to more of that here later. But you, the Euphrates River in the book of Revelation is a reference to the destruction of Rome or at least the harming of it, okay? Let me explain. And I gotta use my I gotta use my notes for this, okay? 
because I'm not a, I'm not a great historian, all right? I know my Bible, I don't know history all that well. All right, so in the beginning days of the Roman Empire, so this is when Rome was, was on, its, on its rise up, it's becoming the mighty world power that it finally became. In those early days, a Roman general named Marcus Crassus marched against Parthia. Remember me telling you about Parthian war horses and how they, they, had war, they had spikes in the front and spikes in the back, okay? They marched against Parthia, which is east of the Euphrates River. It's on the other side, okay? They lost the battle, which resulted in the death of 20,000 Romans and the capture of 10,000 more. After that, the thought of an attack from the Euphrates River became synonymous with defeat. And in fact, we have ancient uh, Roman writings, Roman historians, who would use the Euphrates River as symbolic language to, to speak of the downfall of Rome coming. And so, early on in the Roman Empire, they crossed the, they crossed the Euphrates River, fought against the Parthian, Parthenians, and were beaten pretty badly. And were whooped back across the Euphrates River. Ever since then, the Euphrates River, from among the Roman people, became symbolic for defeat. And so, what you see here is this releasing of the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates, meaning what? The defeat of Rome. The conquering of Rome. That's exactly right. You think back to, the, to who it was that was on the other side of the Euphrates River. Well, it was the Parthenians. And again... Uh, Roman historians say that one of the biggest reasons why they lost that battle is they could not deal with the Parthenian war horses. That was the reason why they lost that battle. The Parthians, they, they had this uncanny ability of fighting forwards and backwards. In fact, their bowmen were so good that they were able to turn around and shoot backwards like that like no other army could at that time. And the Romans just simply couldn't deal with it. And so... That's why you have a, a and, and tails were mentioned once, but we're going to see t uh, uh, tails and the powers in the tail mentioned a, another time here in just a second, and that's more than likely the reason why. Okay. Now, so that's the release of the four angels, and again, destruction's coming, defeat is coming to Rome. That's the whole purpose. The number of the armies of the horsemen was two hundred million, simply representing this massive number that was against them. Now, look at the destruction of the horsemen, verses 17 through 19, 17 through 19, and Casey, why don't you read that uh, section of scripture to you, please, sir. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses, horse, horses were like the heads of lions, and cut out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. Okay, so there's a reference again to the fact that their tails do harm, which again speaks of the defeat of Rome. That's what we're talking about. And it mentions that they have breast, breastplates the color of fiery red, um... In just a second, breastplates of fiery red, um, the color of fire, and of hyacinth and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions, and their mouth uh, proceed out with fire. So re representing their fire, smoke, and brimstone, as mentioned twice in verses 17 and 18. And again, just giving this picture of, of destruction coming. The heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And in verse 19, it says that they have tails that are like serpents. And again, just pointing to more uh, a, a picture of destruction to come. Uh, moving on, it says that a third of mankind was killed by these three plagues. Again, just, just, just make a mental note of that. We're not talking about the end of the world. The end of the world is not going to come by only having a third of it destroyed. It's all going to be burned up. So you cannot take this verse out and apply it to the end of the world. It's talking just about the destruction of Rome. Okay? The so third of mankind was, bit, was killed by these three plagues. And then lastly, notice the sad reaction 
of mankind and that the rest of mankind did not repent. Look at verses 20 and 21, and let's read that together as we conclude this evening. Verse 20 and 21, it says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and of silver and of brass and of stone and of wood, which can neither, neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. And so even though all of this destruction comes upon mankind, it gives us a picture there of, of a hardened heart that's unwilling to repent, that's unwilling to change. And again, we see that. When, when we look back on history and we see the fall of Rome, we see the fall of a country who was unwilling to change all the way up to the very last. And that's exactly what we see right here. just been established. I mean, his son was just on the earth, not 60 years before this. And now his children, the Christians, are being slaughtered simply because they refused to worship the, the, the Roman emperor. And so, even those people, he gives time to repent. And you better believe he gives us lots of time to repent as well. And you know what? We may not be able to stand and see the parting of the Red Sea. We may not have seen Jesus hanging on the cross nor did we see the result of what took place here in prophecy in Revelation chapter 9. But I can tell you one thing, I can believe just the same. And that's what he demands of us, and that's what he asks of us. And so let's conclude with this thought right here. First of all, Revelation chapter 9, same message, different vision. Rome's going to be destroyed. It's because of the martyred Christians, and it's not going to be pretty. And he offers them repentance, as, as does Pharaoh. And so tonight... I offer you the same thing. The Lord offers it to you. He offers you repentance. And if you're not a child of God, again, tonight's the night. Don't leave until you've made your soul right with Him. He wants you to be baptized. He wants you to become a child of God. If you're not a child of God, we can make that right tonight. And if you feel like you need to repent of a sin, if you feel like you're not living your life exactly how God wants you to live it, Again, why wait? Make your life right with Him. There's no more pressing matter in your life. If anybody has any need at all, again, we don't offer the invitation on Sunday nights, but uh, please feel free to talk to me afterwards, and I'd love to visit with you about that.